Greetings from sunny Brussels. I'm Bruno Lete, a senior fellow with the German Marshall Fund, and thanks to, to all of you for joining today uh, on this debate about Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic integration. Um, I'd say this topic is almost part of the German Marshall Fund's DNA, and uh, GMF has been working for many years now on Georgia-related issues, but also on the ground uh, in Georgia, as a matter of fact. Uh, we do so through our Black Sea Trust Fund that supports civil society in Georgia, uh, but we also address the policy issues pertaining to Georgia's Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. Um, I'd say for me, it's also a bit of a personal story. Um, as a young graduate, I actually came in contact with Georgia for the very first time uh, back in 2006, 2007, when I started working with Ronald Asmus, as a matter of fact. Uh, and after the 2008 war, uh, very unfortunately assisted him with some of his research for, for the book, A Little War That Shook the World. So I'd say uh, for me, it's a little bit like the song by Ray Charles, Georgia has always been uh, on my mind. Um, so what we do want to talk about today, um, Georgia has made great strides to integrate with the European and Euro-Atlantic community. If, if, if we just zoom out for a second, uh, in less than two decades, the country signed an association agreement and a DCFTA with the European Union. Uh, Georgia became an enhanced opportunity partner with NATO. So that's actually a pretty impressive result uh, in, in two decades. But of course, on every successful path, uh, there's always choices that need to make, be made as well. And uh, it's important that all parties involved, Tbilisi, Brussels, Washington, uh, keep seeing eye to eye when it comes to the next steps for Georgia's uh, relationship with the West uh, and vice versa. And of course, the upcoming October uh, parliamentary elections in Georgia uh, puts an extra pot spotlight on the relationship between EU, NATO uh, and Georgia. So that's a little bit in a nutshell what we want to address today. Uh, is Georgia still delivering on structural reforms? What are the next steps for Georgia's EU and NATO integration? And how can the EU and NATO support Georgia uh, in its endeavors? Uh, but also perhaps look a bit more internationally. For instance, is Russia's continued aggression uh, in the frozen conflict endangering uh, Georgia's integration with the West? Um, to address these complex questions, uh, we invited four fabulous speakers to contribute. Uh, and as your humble moderator, it is my pleasure to introduce them to you very briefly. Uh, we have Mr. Irakli Beraya, the chairperson of the Foreign Relations Committee, in the Parliament of Georgia, welcome. Um, Ms. Marina Kaljurans, member of the European Parliament, but also the chair of the EU-Georgia Parliamentary Association Committee. Uh, welcome to you as well. Obviously, we also know you for being a former foreign minister of, of, of Georgia, uh, sorry, of Estonia, <laughs> apologies. Uh, James Apaturai, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Political Affairs and Security Policy at NATO HQ but also a special representative for the Caucasus and Central uh, Asia. Welcome to you. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ruxandra Popa, the Secretary General of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Thanks to all of you uh, for being here. Just uh, as a last remark, perhaps a few house rules. So this conversation is on the record, but uh, that shouldn't stop us from having a very honest and interactive conversation. Please feel free to share your straightforward thoughts. Uh, first, we'll turn uh, to our speakers for some brief comments, and, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the panel is not able to see you, uh, our audience, uh, with the Zoom tool, but uh, there is a little button uh, on your screen, the chat function, where you can actually uh, post your comments and your question. I I'll be closely monitoring that feed uh, to make sure that uh, you can participate with uh, this discussion. So we have about 75 minutes now, and without much further ado, I would like to uh, start with you, Irakli Beraya, and perhaps to kickstart this debate with a question, let me perhaps refer to the title of this event. Uh, is Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic integration still on track?
You may have to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, do you hear? Great. Thank you very much, Ms. Oletze. Let me size this opportunity and thank German Marshall Fund for holding this panel discussion in Georgia. This is my distinct honor to participate together with great supporters and friends of Georgia, such as Ms. Kalyurand, Ms. Rafatarai, Ms. Ruxandra Popa, which are great uh, friends and supporters of Georgia. It can, be, uh, it can be stated without exaggeration that since regaining our independence, Georgia has firmly taken the path of Western development. Membership in EU and NATO is not only the top foreign and security policy objective, but a value-based choice of Georgian citizens. This is by no means accidental. Georgia has always considered itself as an integral part of Europe and has been endemically of European culture. During our millennial history, Georgians have been bearers of European values, protectors of human dignity and rights, and Georgia actively participated in protecting European civilization and historically has been military stronghold of the European continent, its reliable outpost. And this is what forms a solid foundation of our European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. Also in our uh, modern history, the absolute majority of Georgian population once again emphasized its original destiny, belonging to the European family, when in plebiscite, 77% of our citizens supported integration into the Euro-Atlantic community. And the Georgian dream government today has been best serving this value-based decision of our people through tangible steps and results. Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic future has been cemented in the new constitution that was adopted in 2017, which obligates the constitutional bodies to undertake all measures to achieve countries' full membership in EU and NATO. Despite Russian occupation and aggressive hybrid warfare waged against Georgia, we have not been deterred from getting closer to the West. On the contrary, under government led by the Georgian dream, our country has accelerated its integration process and the rapprochement with the West has reached unprecedented levels unknown to Georgia before. Our relations with the EU and NATO have never been as dynamic and substance driven as they are today. And uh, it is vividly manifested in political and practical avenues of cooperation. As to the NATO integration, Georgia has registered significant progress, which is underlined in multiple official documents, statements by political and military leadership of the Alliance and its allies. Through strengthening our democracy, bold reforms in defense and security, Georgia has grown from security consumer into an active security provider. Its steadfast support to uh, NATO missions and operations, significant contribution to the RSN as the largest per capita contributor. The active engagement in the Black Sea security architecture all demonstrate our country's ability for and the firm commitment to your Atlantic security. We've been complying with NATO's rule of spending 2% of our GDP on defense and with 20% of defense budget spent on major acquisitions, which places Georgia ahead of many members of the Alliance. And the practical track of Georgia on its path to your Atlantic integration has also been very impressive. According to Alliance, Georgia has all the practical tools for membership and has done much more with these tools than any other aspirant nation so far. And among those is substantial NATO Georgia package, which was endorsed in 2014 at Wales Summit. Implementation assessments, as it is well known, have constantly been very positive and Georgia is one of the Alliance's closest operational and most interoperable partners and since 2014, NATO's enhanced opportunities partner. As to the European integration, Georgia has been the leader among the Eastern Partnership countries in democratic development and the approximation with the Union. In 2014, two years after Georgian Dream entered into the government, Georgia signed the association agreement with the EU, which has been a game changer in EU-Georgia relations and made our integration process irreversible. It gives us a possibility of a far-reaching economic integration through gradual access to EU single market and creates a solid ground to establish deep and comprehensive free trade area. Georgia has put in place impressive reforms in the fields of the rule of law, penitentiary, education, science and innovations, transport, energy, civil service, to name a few, and up to 170 legislative acts of the European Union have been transposed in Georgia's national uh, legislation. Implementation of the association agreement has been traditionally 
positively assessed by the European Commission and by the European Parliament, as was the case a couple days ago. And yesterday, the uh, implementation report on the association agreement by Swen Mixer, a uh, great friend and supporter of Georgia, was voted and adopted by the European Parliament. We have short stay visa free regime, which has been a major achievement on our integration path, as well as joining the European energy community, Georgia's inclusion in trans European transport network, Erasmus Plus program, uh, EU Georgia strategic security dialogue that was launched in 2017 are among significant achievements on the EU integration path. EU is actively involved in promotion of peace and stability in Georgia through Geneva international discussions special representative in South Caucasus in the crisis in Georgia, and through EUMM, which is uh, a very significant uh, international credible mechanism for peace and stability on the ground. And Georgia, for its part, also contributes to EU CSDP missions and operations. This is evident that, this, uh, that the distance between EU and Georgia, uh, both physical and political has been shrinking. Under our government, the country's rapprochement with the EU and NATO has been all time high. We made it the top priority on our political and legislative agenda. And along with the notable accomplishments in areas such as consolidation of democracy, human rights protection, rule of law and good governance, impressive achievements on EU and NATO integration path have served as a solid ground for and the main reasons behind high confidence in the government among the population. We also acknowledge that uh, still a lot needs to be accomplished. Since 2012, the Georgian dream has been elected twice for two consecutive terms and after eight years of successful, successful governance of Georgia, its credibility and popularity among the population is still very strong because it has been meeting effectively high expectations of Georgian people. And if elected again this October to govern the country, for another 40 years, GD will work to further strengthen Georgian democracy and move our country forward to further achieve our national security and foreign policy goals and importantly, to accelerate countries integration into European Union and into the NATO. And finally, recent constitutional and legislative changes to establish more proportional system in 2020 parliamentary elections and those to reflect ODA recommendations as well as the shift to fully proportional electoral system in 2024 amply prove Georgia's commitment to stronger democracy and European values. No doubt that the upcoming elections will represent an important opportunity to evaluate the effectiveness of the reforms implemented and will once again demonstrate the sustainability and maturity of the Georgian democracy and will give additional impulse to Georgia's EU and NATO integration. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, transmitting a very clear message and uh, clearly underlining uh, the dedication of, of, of Georgia towards uh, the EU and NATO uh, partnership. So let me just take this message for, for a moment and turn to you, Marina Kaliran. Uh, we hear oh. Iraqis saying like, look, um, there's a strong political and civil desire to go towards the EU. Uh, we have a DCFTA, we have a station agreement visa-free travel, we are a security actor. So the pieces of the puzzle are on the table. But from the EU perspective, is that puzzle yet complete? W what are the next steps here? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruno. Uh, thank you, Rockley. And to start with, I'd also like to thank GMF for putting this topic on the table and for including me into this panel. And Bruno, please call me Marina. We know each other for years already. So. Uh, to start with, everybody started a personal note. Uh, yes, I'm former Estonian foreign minister. And needless to say that Georgia has been very close to Estonia for uh, development cooperation, for partnerships, for sharing common history for years. And uh, I personally was Estonian ambassador to Russia in 2008 when the war between Russia and Georgia broke out. If you remember a year before there were attacks on Estonia. So there are very many ties that connect my country to Georgia, that connect me personally to Georgia. And I'm really proud and happy that maybe I can bring more of that attitude and attention to Georgia also to the European Parliament. 
And when I say that, what I feel in Europe, what I feel in the European Parliament, uh, many people, many politicians are tired. They are tired of Eastern Partnership. They are tired of talking about Ukraine, Georgia. Now we have Belarus which means that attention to Eastern Partnership might be again higher for some time. But I do not see here huge appetite for discussing Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, other Eastern Partnership countries. So one of the tasks, as I see also for me here, is to keep it high on agenda. To keep Georgia relations with EU, relations, uh, Georgian democratic development reforms, high on political agenda in the European Parliament. Because the Georgian people have spoken. Iraqli pointed to the public opinion. The polls show that the Georgian people have chosen their path of closer integration with, uh, uh, with the EU. And here comes also our responsibility from the EU side to support and to, to show solidarity while on that track. So although maybe uh, Georgia is not very high on political agenda in the European Parliament. I have to say that we have regular discussions and uh, as the co-chair of the uh, European Parliament, Georgia PAC, I can only reiterate full support to Georgia's aspirations, full support to Georgia's sovereignty, territorial integrity and so on. So no question about that. Uh, as Iraqi said, we had a couple of days uh, ago discussion on Georgia. It was the implementation agreement. It was the implementation of the association agreement report, which was uh, written in a very balanced way, which was written by my very good uh, colleague Sven Mixer, also former Estonian foreign minister. You know what's interesting? Everybody in Europe is, who is dealing with Georgia are Estonians. Because when we talk about the special representative for South Caucasus, it's also Toy Waklar. He's also Estonian, former Estonian diplomat. So Georgia, you're in the hands of Estonians in the European, uh, in the European Parliament and in the European institutions. That was a joke. But when we were discussing the implementation agreement, I followed very closely the political groups. And it was good to see that there is unan unanimity uh, within the European Parliament, irrespective, okay, maybe some weird parliamentarians, but majority of European Parliament unwaveringly supports Georgia. So when uh, Iraq mentioned that uh, Georgia is the, uh, is the leader country among Eastern Partnership, and I don't question that. Georgia has been a leader, and uh, that's also shown by the enhanced partnership that we have. EU with Georgia, which is based on the more for more principle. So as a partner and as a close friend, we're talking about uh, progress made, but we also raise the challenges that still remain. And uh, mm, uh, I completely and fully recognize the reforms made by Georgia, but I'd also want to be very clear that there are things that still need to be done in the field of rule of law, in the field of uh, rights of minorities, in the field of environmental law, and there are other fields. And here I'll continue with constitutional reform. Needless to say that a year ago, it was a huge disappointment when the law did not pass parliament. But again, I'd like to recognize the political parties of Georgia for putting their act together and for passing the constitutional and electoral law this summer. So Georgia is in the pre-election period. Pre-election period is a difficult period in every country. Uh, uh, looking from Brussels, I see huge polarization. So if there is anybody from Georgia listening to our conference today, I'd like to urge all political parties, and when I say all political parties, I mean also opposition, to, their, to do their utmost to secure peaceful, fair uh, elections. Because we used to say that these elections are of utmost importance, but trust me, these elections will determine the future of Georgia for many years to come. So it's crucially important 
that they are conducted in a uh, in a transparent, open, fair way. And I'd also like to recognize Georgia's initiative in inviting observers. And I understand that OSCE is already uh, planning or is already doing, uh, going to, to, to observe the elections. You extended the invitation to the European Parliament. And I can only assure you that it's high on political agenda in the European Parliament can't say anything yet because, as you know, because of the COVID-19 uh, regime, uh, there are strict uh, rules in the European Parliament, but there is time to go until the, like, to the elections. So I very much hope, I very much hope that there will be also observers from the European Parliament uh, for the elections. 66 parties, yeah? Not an easy, not an easy time. So what's important is important is the media freedom, uh, free access to media and proportionate access to media during the pre-electoral time. So I can only say, say I feel my fingers crossed that the parliamentary elections will go smoothly, as I, I say the third time, peacefully in a, uh, in, a fair, in a fair way, because that will determine the future of Georgia. Why it is also important in the present situation, when we see what's happening with Navalny, we see what's happening in Belarus, we see the turmoil also in the Eastern Partnership countries. We see Ukraine. So uh, the, 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 the neighborhood, our neighborhood, Georgia's neighborhood, is not as, let's say, peaceful, as stable as we would like it to see. And therefore, it's important that Georgia continues on its path. How will be your bilateral relations with Belarus at the moment? It will be interesting to hear from you, Iraqli, but I understand it's also pretty sensitive and pretty uh, and, and difficult topic at the moment. My final remarks, uh, I also like to recognize what uh, Georgia did with the COVID-19 crisis. The crisis is not yet over, is not over yet, but the steps undertaken by government are highly recognized, not only in the European Parliament, but uh, WHO, international organizations, all recognize it. What I want to underline, I want to underline that the measures undertaken did not lead to unjustified restrictions on media freedom and civil liberties, what we see even in some EU countries. So the way it was handled, you deserve recognition uh, for that. And I'm also proud that uh, EU and European Parliament, we have dedicated financial resources, 183 million euros under the uh, Team Europe's response to Georgia. So what I want to say, I want to say that we stand with Georgia on ethical, moral grounds. We support your integration, but we're also supporting financially, technically. Where we see closer, into, and that's my final point, of course, I'm not proud that we are not talking about European perspective anymore. I'm not proud about that. I wasn't proud when I was Estonian foreign minister. I'm not proud as the member of European Parliament. You deserve it. But you also know that it's a political question, different countries, different political parties, different understandings. So we have to integrate in all the spheres and fields where we can. You mentioned visa-free travel. Now I see the next step closer economic cooperation, because there's a lot we can do together, opening more our single market and cooperating more uh, in uh, economic matters with Georgia. And uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Dear Marina, thank you very much for highlighting some of the merits, but also some of the challenges. Uh, in the relationship and uh, Iraqi will definitely also turn back to you if you want to comment on some of these things. But uh, first I want to turn uh, to the NATO planet uh, and, and ask you, uh, perhaps James, to, to come in. So um, you are, you know, the NATO uh, ally, I would say, for Georgia and the alliance, perhaps not Estonian yet, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, what, what I thought was interesting to say, for that Marina said, and um, I would like to perhaps hear your perspective on that, saying that, yes, there is great support uh, in the West, in the EU, uh, for Georgia, but uh, it's not always easy to catch the attention of member states to bring that support forward and make it concrete. 
Um, now, Georgia has been a strong ally uh, of NATO over the past year. So how does this all figure out in the NATO world? So first, um, thank you for the, uh, for the opportunity. And um, actually, the first point I wanted to make, which is uh, very much reflected in this discussion, is that it's really important to keep uh, Georgia in the headlines, on the agenda, to have every opportunity to talk about Georgia. Uh, I was just at a meeting uh, an hour ago when we were talking about both Ukraine and Georgia and how because Ukraine is a bigger country, because the conflict is ongoing uh, in a more violent uh, way, uh, Ukraine tends to get some more uh, political attention uh, than Georgia does, uh, at least in the, in the headlines. And, and we were just discussing unrelated to this, how important it is that we keep Georgia high on the agenda. Uh, so let me thank you for organizing this because I think that that's really important. Uh, no, I'm not Estonian. I, I mean, I'd be happy to be Estonian, but it just didn't work out uh, when I was born, uh, but also happy to be Canadian. Um, but we, we all here uh, work very hard to, to make sure that Georgia is valued here. And um, uh, Marina was very open and I want to be just as open um, with you. To be honest, I find that the, the discussion in in NATO about Georgia has become a little bit less complicated uh, in a good way than it used to be. Uh, we used to have very active debates about membership, when uh, that we had to move to membership action plan, now, maybe later, what would happen, what would it take, uh, well, how would Russia react? Um, now the discussion, and I just give you my personal point of view, has settled into, I think, a more steady and sustainable track. And that is everybody stands by the Bucharest decisions that Georgia will become a member of NATO. But we know that the politics of that step are complicated and we just don't have consensus for it now. Uh, Georgia also understands that. Successive Georgian governments have understood that now is not the moment. It doesn't mean they stop pushing. They do push, uh, and they should push. Uh, and I, I had the pleasure of meeting an old friend, Victor Dolitze, who's the new ambassador uh, here. Uh, and what I told him was what I told previous ambassadors as well, as part of our long discussion, is that to my point of view, uh, a Georgian ambassador's job at NATO is to be annoying, uh, to knock on every door, to knock on it again and then again, uh, and uh, and make sure that that you know, my efforts to, to support Georgia here are, uh, you know, very much mirrored by, by theirs. And, and Georgian diplomats are very, very effective at, um, at making sure that Georgia's interests are advanced. And Victor, especially being an ex-politician, will be no exception. So uh, we are, on the one hand, focused very much on reform. Uh, and, and Marina mentioned that as well. We are focused as much on defense reform as we are on other uh, areas of reform. And the EU is obviously less focused on, on the defense aspects, but we are. Uh, and actually overall, they're really going well. And you know, the last time I was out at the Joint Training and Education Center and I saw, first of all, the facility, which we helped establish, but also the soldiers uh, who could be Canadian soldiers. They are very professional, they are experienced, they have been in combat side by side with NATO. They are interoperable with NATO uh, and not just with NATO, also with the European Union. Georgia is contributing not just because of Euro-Atlantic or uh, you know, NATO aspirations. Georgia is contributing to peace and security well beyond uh, the NATO context. Uh, and, and we, NATO, are grateful for that. I know the EU is as well. So I have seen and continue to see the steady improvement in Georgia's ability to defend itself and contribute to international security. And all allies see that. So we continue to support reform. We are refreshing what we call the substantial NATO Georgia package, uh, which focuses on a whole host of areas uh, from interoperability uh, to uh, Black Sea, and I'll come back to Black Sea in a moment, to helping Georgia enhance its resilience against what you might call hybrid or gray zone threats like cyber attacks. Uh, you know, many of us look back at what happened in 2008 and since 2008 
uh, in Georgia and realized that this was a rehearsal for what has happened in Ukraine, what happened uh, now in other areas, and frankly, in some ways, is happening in some of our countries. So we have lessons to learn. This is a two-way street, and we really welcome uh, how much Georgia contributes to our understanding uh, on a day-to-day -day basis of how to secure ourselves. Uh, so we are supporting reform in that way. We have what we call defense capacity program projects. Uh, I was so proud to say that we, we have about 3 million euros in those projects till I heard Marina talk about 183 million from the EU, but that's the way NATO budgets are compared to, um, to EU budgets. Um, we share the view with the European Union that the upcoming election is really important, uh, that it should be run well, that it should be run uh, in a spirit of non-polarization. Uh, you know, I, I know what we some people might be thinking, and there's polarization in many uh, elections, um, including in some NATO countries. But you know, Georgia has to set an example. It is being judged. Uh, by the organizations it wishes to associate itself with. That's just a fact. And you know, you have to be the best kid in class. Georgia has improved and improved and improved, and I have every confidence that it can continue to improve. Um, one of the questions that you sent to us was, you know, why does Georgia matter? And I'll just conclude on that because I think it's, it's very useful for us to get questions and answers. Um, one is from a sort of values point of view, uh, we at NATO really believe, and that's what's enshrined in the Helsinki Final Act as well as our NATO charter, that a democracy that meets NATO standards that's in Europe has the right to apply and we have an obligation to be open to that. That's very important. And it's important for European security that this principle is upheld and we don't accept the idea that there are buffer zones or exclusive areas of uh, influence for Russia, let's be open about this. Uh, it can't work like that. So that's the first reason. And Georgia is, is very much an example of that. The second reason is because of Georgia's commitment to being part of our community. This is a steady, determined, society-wide commitment. Government after government, whatever side of the political spectrum, Georgia is part of the Western democratic community, and we have to recognize that, we have to nourish that. My view, and I think many people feel that, is that there is a certain amount of systemic rivalry going on now, and we, the democracies, have to stand together uh, and protect our values and the systems on which they depend, and Georgia is part of that community. Um, the third reason I, I mentioned briefly, and that's the Black Sea, uh, that's the newish element. Basically, when it annexed Crimea, or since it annexed Crimea, uh, Russia has moved a substantial amount of high-end military equipment into Crimea and used it to project force into the Black Sea to try to deny access to those of us who want to support NATO allies, but also our partners in the Black Sea, and also to project force beyond the Black Sea into the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond. So we need to work together, we NATO and Georgia, as well as Ukraine, to enhance situational awareness, to enhance our resilience, and to make sure that we can do what we need to do to defend our own security, our freedom of movement, uh, in the Black Sea in this new uh, strategic context. And that's one of the most important areas of our new uh, program of cooperation, the refreshing of the substantial NATO Georgia package. Uh, and we hope that uh, very soon at political level, we can take that work forward. So once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, thank you, James. Um, and last but not least, Ruxandra. Um, I mean, your work is, is very interesting in a way that the NATO PA not only deals with intergovernmentalism, but you also go beyond that. You, you work with assemblies and parliaments and NATO partner countries and member states. And, you know, as I was talk, listening to James and Marina saying, yes, we, we need to keep Georgia on the agenda. I mean, it seems to me that your organization plays an essential role there. 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you, thank you, Bruno, and and thank you uh, very much for uh, including me on on this uh, on this excellent uh, panel. Uh, it's always difficult to come last on a panel, uh, but I think with with this particular panel, uh, it's it's even harder. Uh, but I'm I'm delighted to be able uh, to to speak uh, with all of you uh, this afternoon and and exchange with the audience, uh, and and be able to indeed uh, bring in also the the NATO parliamentary uh, assembly's perspective. Uh, I think uh, I can agree uh, with every word uh, that uh, Marina and James uh, have said before me. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, it, it is important, uh, I think, for, for our Georgian friends uh, to know that, yes, um, it, they, they need to help us keep, keep Georgia uh, on, on the agenda. I think we are at a point where uh, uh, NATO is you know, also in a, in a sort of reflection process uh, with the NATO 2030. Um, a process uh, where allies are trying to think uh, what the alliance uh, will look like uh, in, in 20 years from now. Uh, and I think it's important actually for the Georgians to get into that discussion. I know, uh, uh, I know they, they have had uh, an opportunity uh, to, to exchange uh, ideas as well on this process, but I think it is important for them to show that precisely that they are uh, privileged partners of, of NATO and that they have um, uh, views to contribute as well to these uh, grand sort of strategic discussions that, that NATO is having right now, uh, whether it is indeed uh, on, on the future of, of the Black Sea um, and, and our relations uh, with Russia uh, going forward, whether it is on relations with China uh, as well. I, I do think that, uh, that Georgia uh, also has uh, uh, something uh, interesting to contribute uh, there uh, and a perspective that allies will welcome. I think it is part of uh, you know, keeping Georgia uh, on the agenda of the alliance uh, to show that that uh, Georgia can can contribute uh, to this discussion. I think another thing uh, going forward uh, is uh, uh, James uh, mentioned, and I think he rightly mentioned as well, Georgia's uh, remarkable contribution uh, to NATO's operation in Afghanistan and as well as other operational commitments. Uh, I think as we are looking now to uh, hopefully uh, a successful uh, uh, negotiate peace negotiations uh, in Afghanistan and, and a reduction of, of NATO's presence there. Uh, it will be important as well for uh, for Georgia um, uh, to also show that you know it is uh, it remains uh, willing uh, to engage in in other uh, NATO uh, operational uh, theaters uh, and and keep up that that engagement. Uh, but to come back to yeah the core of my business and sort of, of parliamentary engagements. Um, one thing that is, uh, that is, I think, clear to us and, and, and certainly uh, I know clear to, to James uh, is you know, political stability and, and adherence to democratic principles uh, is a key condition for, for NATO membership and our, our Georgian friends know that. Uh, NATO is, is a values-based uh, alliance and the NATO Parliamentary Assembly being uh, independent and, and separate of NATO uh, still considers itself uh, in a way also as uh, as sort of um, you know embodying this idea of, of an alliance uh, ba based on values and so we have worked uh, over the years very closely with our Georgian friends um, to to support uh, you know reform uh, in in Georgia political reform and we've worked with the parliament uh, in particular and I think since the move uh, to the uh, to the parliamentary system of, of government obviously the role of parliament has, has taken on uh, increased importance uh, in, in Georgia. And so uh, making sure that uh, you know, we build the, the mechanisms of, of parliamentary oversight uh, and democratic control of the armed forces and the security sector uh, is a key, uh, absolutely a key objective uh, for, for Georgia's uh, European and, and Euro-Atlantic uh, integration. Um, this year has been uh, an eventful uh, year for, for Georgia, I would say. Uh, I think we all welcome the, the, uh, the resolution of, of the political crisis uh, that started uh, at the end of, of last year uh, and, and into this year, and, and, and we very much uh, welcome uh, the uh, uh, adoption of, of a new uh, electoral uh, framework uh, for, this, uh, for these coming elections. Uh, but it wasn't easy getting there. Uh, I, I think uh, Iraqi will recognize that uh, it was not an easy process. Um, and in a way, you know, th this shows that there might still be some work to do uh, in, in indeed addressing the polarization uh, in, in Georgia's political system. 
I agree with Marina, with James, these elections will be important. Uh, they will be important as well because the 2018 uh, presidential elections, um, let's be honest, were not good. The international observers, uh, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly contributed to the, uh, to the observation. The report of the international observers uh, back then um, was was very critical and I think one of the most critical in, in, in recent years. So I think all our organizations will indeed be watching this election uh, closely uh, and, and working uh, uh, with our Georgian friends uh, to ensure that the conditions are met uh, for a free and, and fair election. Um, what I did want to say is that I think this dialogue that we've seen ahead of this election will need absolutely to continue after the election. So it's not that we've solved all the uh, all the issues now with these, uh, the March agreements uh, and the adoption of, of, of the uh, new electoral framework. I think uh, you know whoever gets a majority uh, in, in the October election uh, will need to recognize that there's actually still a lot uh, that uh, needs to be agreed. Uh, Georgia will still be in a transition process until the 2024 elections. And so that political dialogue uh, will need to, to continue uh, between whoever's majority and whoever uh, is in opposition. And I think that that would be a, a, a key message. Um, where, where I see a, a very positive element, I was looking at a recent uh, NDI poll, uh, which shows actually the confidence that the Georgian people have uh, in their political system. Uh, that said that 48% of Georgians think Georgia is now a democracy and 56% are confident that the election will be free and fair. And I think that's something that I think uh, uh, we, should, uh, we should certainly take, take comfort in, in, in uh, uh, as, as a, indeed as a very strong basis uh, for Georgia's uh, future steps towards uh, European and, and Euro-Atlantic integration. Thank, thank you very much, Roxandra. It is hard to be the last speaker, but your points were nonetheless most relevant. So thanks, thanks for your contribution. Um, we, I already see the Q&A chats exploding, so there's a lot of questions coming in here. Uh, also in my email inbox, by the way. So, but be, you know, I want to, to, go, to get back to Iraqli before taking some of the questions. I mean, Iraqli, we, we talked a lot about Georgia now for the past 30 minutes. Um, Basically, what I hear is that, you know, you got unconditional support, uh, you know, the EU and NATO have Georgia's back, but uh, everyone expects to see continued progress on some legislative points. Uh, so, please, feel free to perhaps give some reactions to, to what you just heard. And you would need to unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much. Let me thank all the participants, all the speakers for their uh, very interesting assessments and comments with regards to Georgia and uh, with the spirit of support, uh, which they all share with uh, regards to my country. The uh, international partners of Georgia are uh, valuable actors which empower Georgia on its way towards our cherished goals and uh, ideals. And uh, this is also where we feel empowered and where we feel very strong as we have faith and confidence in our partners. Very important issues were addressed here uh, by all the speakers. Uh, Ms. Kalyurant has mentioned the necessity to continuously implement uh, the reforms because there have been a lot of progress implemented by Georgia on its way towards European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. And there is still uh, pretty much that needs to be done. Uh, absolutely, I would uh, agree. Georgia has been uh, very uh, successful in uh, consolidating the democracy in areas such as rule of law, anti-corruption reforms, um, in uh, strengthening our defense and security institutions, in enhancing human rights protection, media freedom, judicial independence in many other areas. And of course, if we ask ourselves a question whether this is sufficient or not, and if there is a room for further improvement, the answer would be definitely yes. The essence and uh, the objectives of the reforms are, as they are not a single step actions and one time undertakings, when reforms are implemented, it's a continuous process. The environments change, 
opportunities change, challenges change, and the reforms should be constantly adapted to changing needs and opportunities. When reforms are implemented, they need to be assessed. And if the rooms for improvements are there still, and if there are certain gaps, they need to be definitely filled. And today, the government of Georgia has very credible legal and institutional mechanisms to reveal those gaps and in case of need to fill those gaps with tangible steps made towards their improvement. And uh, primarily and most of all, there is high readiness, political readiness among the present government to make further improvements if they are necessary and needed for uh, demo further democratic development of Georgia, for human rights protection, for advancing our country in every single aspect where we believe necessary pro further progress needs uh, to be made. And uh, we will not also rest on our laurels and we will continue progress, which Georgia has made that tremendous progress and we will successfully continue to build on the reforms and on that progress. Of course, a very important remark has been made here with regards to the parliamentary oversight from the parliamentary perspective. Georgian parliament uh, and its strength has been very exemplary for the uh, last uh, years and especially with the adoption of the new constitution which turned Georgia into a full parliamentary democracy, boosted the powers of the parliament and enhanced its functions and roles. And importantly, a very important novelty which was introduced by the new constitution is boosting oversight powers of the Georgian legislative branch over the executive government and importantly over the defense and security sphere. And those revolutionary changes, I would say so, have been uh, very much positively assessed by our international partners. They have been uh, uh, recommending for, uh, uh, for Georgia making those improvements. The recommendations have been spelled out in annual national program, for example, in other documents. And Georgia have translated those recommendations from the international partners. And of course, importantly, our agenda to make further improvements into the national legislation. And today we have very sophisticated, very effective mechanism of the oversight over the executive. Importantly, over defense and security field to the levels which Georgia has not seen before. But if we say, are we still perfect in the oversight over the executive, in the oversight uh, over defense and security oversight? The answer would be probably not because no one is perfect in the oversight uh, on the planet. And we are constantly exploring new opportunities to make further improvements after the adoption of the new constitution, after the adoption of the new rules of procedure, of course, we will have enough time to further assess their effectiveness, whether provisions that are perfect on the paper, if they are as effective in practice. And of course, once feeling necessity to further improve those mechanisms, we will do that with great pleasure. We have our international partners that also closely follow these developments, and we will also be very happy to share their best practices and translate them into our national legislative provisions, as was the case in previous legislative uh, amendments. And uh, importantly, uh, our integration uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the Alliance, it has been, uh, to repeat it, to reiterate it again, a value-based choice of the citizens of Georgia. And of course, we're very actively making uh, tangible steps towards our Euro-Atlantic integration. Georgia has approached notable progress. It is a active security provider uh, along with being also a security consumer. And I believe that the presence, the uh, visibility of the Alliance, more engagement in the region and with Georgia also will be necessary to strengthen not only resilience and uh, security of Georgia, but also the security of the, of the wider region. And uh, I believe that in the course of our discussion, I will have an opportunity to further elaborate on the importance of NATO and uh, Georgia's involvement in uh, the security architecture in the region. 
Thank you very much, Irakli. Um, I'd like to take a few questions now from the audience. Uh, there are some relevant um, questions being raised here. And I think that uh, if, I, if I look at it broadly, there's questions pertaining to EU-Georgia relations and, and NATO-Georgia relations. So I'll try to make an elegant split, if I can put it this way. Uh, but by all means, you know, if the, if the, the entire panel should feel free to, to, to share your comments on that. So when it comes to Europe and Georgia, if, if I may summarize briefly, there are some questions, a couple of them actually, talking about the Eastern Partnership and raising the possibility for the Eastern Partnership to be a more powerful tool uh, to integrate Georgia in the European Union and can perhaps an alliance of uh, EU member states, uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania was mentioned specifically, can an alliance of member states push more progress inside uh, the Eastern Partnership and, and you know, generate more support for the, this initiative? Further on this, there's a lot of questions as well going to investments and, and economics. Um, does the EU have plans for more regional initiatives to boost infrastructure, infrastructure and economic developments? Uh, many people raise the possibility for Georgia to be a link between Europe and, and Asia, for instance, while also raising some concerns about the investment climate. Some people uh, are mentioning a couple of well-publicized uh, disputes um, with external investors. So how can we uh, address these. Uh, for instance, the Port of Anakli case uh, was mentioned. Uh, furthermore on that, um, there's also a lot of questions about NATO, as I said. Um, some people raise the concern that what is actually the impact of the frozen conflicts uh, in Georgia on Georgia-NATO relations? Uh, can these be an obstacle to further relationship uh, between both parties. Um, there was also um, a question saying that we've been stressing the good relationship between Georgia and NATO, uh, but you know, some a participant is asking, what can NATO do, for instance, from itself to um, create further steps for NATO-Georgia relations? Um, Georgia can come up with suggestions, but does NATO have suggestions of its own uh, as possible next steps uh, for this relationship? And um, there was also a question actually <laughs> uniting the EU and NATO in this. Uh, a participant was mentioning that um, it seems that there must be more cooperation between EU and NATO towards Georgia, that there could be a joint strategy, maybe some sort of, of task division uh, between the EU and NATO to generate more support uh, towards Georgia and to fight this fatigue uh, that was mentioned uh, on a number of occasions. So um, perhaps I would take this as a first round of questions. There are more questions as a matter of fact, but uh, this could already give us a, a good first round. And let me perhaps uh, switch the order of how we started and go to NATO first. Uh, Ruxandra and then perhaps James. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bruno. Uh, I'll stick here of, of EU just to mention that uh, Sven Mixer uh, was also not, you know, among his, his many uh, important roles was also vice president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And so uh, uh, it's, it's great to see uh, him uh, now uh, in his uh, role at the European Parliament. Um, on, on the questions uh, relating to NATO, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, James will, uh, will answer much better than, than I can. I think uh, on, the, on the frozen conflicts, uh, uh, certainly on, on the assembly side, and, and I wouldn't want to speak on, on NATO side, but um, there's a, a absolutely a clear uh, uh, support uh, within the assembly for, for Georgia's uh, territorial integrity uh, and sovereignty. Uh, and a very clear, clear statement that no third party holds a veto over anybody's uh, foreign policy uh, choices and alliance uh, choices. So I think that that's the very clear position, uh, certainly uh, within the assembly. Um, and I think uh, the the Georgian government uh, has has really uh, done some some uh, really excellent work uh, trying trying to reach out 
uh, to actually populations uh, in, in uh, uh, the Georgian uh, provinces of, of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, including in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so I think uh, I, will, I will leave it to that, but I think, yeah, the position within, within the assembly on this uh, is, is very clear. Um, what can NATO uh, offer? For, uh, as you know, opportunities for cooperation with Georgia. Again, I will leave to James to answer, but I, I do think that NATO is being very creative uh, in the type of, of packages that uh, uh, that it offers uh, to Georgia. Uh, in in my uh, presentation, I try to suggest some other uh, you know some other uh, potential uh, uh, avenues uh, for for further uh, cooperation with Georgia. Uh, the Black Sea, which which James mentioned, I think is a really uh, important area. Uh, indeed, the Assembly actually is discussing a report uh, this year uh, on Black Sea uh, economics, but it's really Black Sea uh, strat st strategy and strategic uh, cooperation, uh, where indeed the, the strong uh, role of, of Georgia and Ukraine um, in, in the region and the importance of, you know, uh, connecting them uh, uh, into the alliance uh, is, is really highlighted. On uh, EU-NATO um, joint strategy on Georgia, uh, absolutely. I mean, personally, I think that that would be uh, it would be excellent to be able to uh, build bridges. Um, as you know, we can build bridges with the European Parliament. Uh, the European Parliament uh, participates in the NATO PA as well with a, a very active uh, delegation led by uh, Chris Peters. Um, and I think we can also contribute to to actually bring that discussion closer. Uh, I'm currently actually reading uh, national contributions to uh, uh, the Assembly's future contribution to NATO 2030. Uh, and actually a, a common theme in all the contributions that I've read recently uh, is the need to strengthen uh, NATO-EU cooperation on a broad range of issues uh, from uh, relations with China to Russia. Uh, and so certainly uh, as well uh, uh, in terms of our relations with, with the neighborhood. So um, fully in support of that. Thank you, Ruxandra. James. Thank you. Uh, and I'll pick up because, of course, we uh, think very similarly, Ruxandra and I, but I'll pick up where, where she left off. I think you're quite right to sort of group the NATO-EU uh, set of questions. And I think actually starting with the Eastern Partnership is a good way to go with that. I think it's important to remember that there are six countries in the EU's Eastern Partnership, five of the six have territorial disputes with Russia behind them. Uh, and the sixth country is Belarus. And if it, you know, as a result of current events, tried to make a move towards the West, you can imagine it would also have a territorial dispute. This is a Russian strategy uh, to destabilize its Western neighborhood, including to prevent those countries with which might wish to move towards the West from doing so. It is a lever of control. And Georgia has not escaped this. It's been one of the first to experience it. Uh, and Russia turns it up and turns it down, depending on day-to-day -day events. Uh, so I think that's very much the context in which Georgia operates and the context in which we should be thinking about uh, how we engage together, NATO in the EU, with countries uh, bordering uh, Russia. The EU calls it an Eastern Partnership. We don't have that same sort of framework, but we do have very uh, dedicated programs of political and practical cooperation with all uh, of the same countries, less with Belarus, uh, obviously, but with the rest uh, very much so, including offices there and, and programs of cooperation. So um, is uh, this leads me you know, directly to the question that you posed. Is Russia's presence in destabilization of uh, these two regions of Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, as we call them, um, an obstacle to further integration by Georgia to, to NATO. And uh, obviously, this is part of the intent. What I would say is, I, I don't want to be naive or try to, to, to say things that aren't, aren't true. Of course, it's complicating. It complicates things uh, for the NATO governments because this is uh, a dispute which um, which very much bears on our relations with Russia as well, and and so that has to be taken into account. But 
What is also the case is that this has been the situation since 2008. But despite that, at every NATO statement, every summit where we have statements at ministerials, the allies together agree to restate our commitment that Georgia will become a member of the alliance and all the other associated decisions. Um, those of you who are diplomats who have worked in, in this kind of field know it's pretty easy, not necessarily to go back on a consensus, but just not to say it anymore. But we do say it. Uh, and we say it and repeat it because it's a very important principle. So is it complicating? Yes. Is it a deal breaker? No. Uh, I think that's the bottom line. Um, do we, uh, NATO, contribute to ideas for furthering our, our cooperation? I, I think I can safely say we do, and I think our Georgian friends would say the same. Some of the ideas are ours. Some of the ideas are theirs. Many of the ideas we develop together. So, for example, uh, with the Black Sea cooperation, I was having lunch with my good friend who heads up the Coast Guard uh, in, in Blisi uh, a little while ago, and he was talking about um, the need to develop the Coast Guard. And, you know, it came up in our discussion that in helping Georgia develop the Coast Guard, we not only help Georgia better secure its own territory, but Georgia has better situational awareness of what's going on in the Black Sea as the situation deteriorates. And that information can be shared with NATO and we can share our own information. So it's a real two way street in terms of developing areas of cooperation and in terms of the cooperation itself. So we benefit too. Uh, from ideas, and we offer ideas, and I hope we provide benefits uh, as well. And, and then to conclude, um, this will not stop with day-to-day -day current events. Georgia is being consulted on the NATO 2030 process. In other words, as we look forward to the future of NATO, uh, one of the not very many partners who are being consulted in this process, and in the case of Georgia, it's already happened, uh, is Georgia. To hear Georgia's ideas about the future of Euro-Atlantic security, Black Sea security, partnership, membership, and, and Georgia's place in uh, the future NATO and what NATO does. So uh, Georgia is part of uh, our thinking process going into the future as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, James and Ruxandra, for elaborating on the NATO uh, side. Um, Marina, there were also a lot of uh, questions pertaining to the European Union and, and, and the relationship with Georgia. So I, I, I trust you have some answers for our audience. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I'll try to be brief. There was a question about uh, Eastern Partnership. and. Uh, Eastern Partnership uh, was created in 2009 as the policy of the EU and uh, Eastern Partners working together. So recently we celebrated the 10th anniversary. And during the conferences that were held, all partners stressed that Eastern Partnership has contributed a lot. Uh, in principle, it's a policy of the EU, but each and every partner can have their role can have their ambitions and have their specific relations. So we can see it, as I said, with Georgia, we, we have with the same principle, more for more, we see it in practical life. Although there are six Eastern Partnership partners, how different they are. How different is their cooperation with the EU? So I see this policy as giving opportunities for closer cooperation in all possible fields. Should the three Baltics be the engine? Well, the EU is built the way that, of course, some countries have some interests in the region and other countries have maybe interests in other regions. And of course, the Baltics are on the border of the EU and NATO. Of course, we are more interested in the Eastern Partnership. But the strength of the EU is in speaking in one voice, all 27 of us. So even, as I said, we try to keep it on the agenda in the EU, higher political agenda in the EU, the strength comes when the EU speaks in one voice. And as a remark, I listened yesterday to Ursula von der Leyen. I don't know, Iraq, if you noticed or not, but she mentioned Eastern Partnership. Just very briefly in the context of other partnerships, but she said it. In the summer, when she addressed European Parliament for the first time, she didn't mention it at all. 
and I was very frustrated about that. So it's important that it's being mentioned not only by the Baltics, but by all other member states, by institutions, by those who address the topics. So that's the strength of the EU. Then there was a very specific question about the projects that EU is supporting in Georgia. And I just uh, found a fact sheet directly if you want to add something. But at the moment, for example, EU is supporting East-West Highway, uh, water infrastructure in Ajara, Kahetia, uh, Imereti, modernization of the Enguri Dam, and I can continue. So the short answer is yes, EU is supporting not only um, national projects, but supporting also, also smaller regional projects. And the final question to Steve, I don't know if Steve is still following us. Uh, Steve's question on EU-NATO cooperation. Of course it should be better. As a former foreign minister, when I was sitting in the EU meetings, come to some countries, some countries, not my country, some countries, were saying one thing. Then I went to the NATO foreign ministers. They're saying maybe the same, the same things, but kind of different flavor or different touches or different emphasis. So even us speaking uh, at different forums, we change our language. So of course there should be closer cooperation. And uh, not only on Georgia, but absolutely in all fields. I, I believe in closer cooperation. And Steve sent an answer saying that RAND cooperation is working on this topic. So if we will not be able to hear from Steve during today's discussion, I'm sure we'll be able to hear from him soon. So what's RAND cooperation suggest, suggesting on closer cooperation of EU and NATO? So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And I just see in the Q&A feed from Stephen that he's still listening attentively, smiling. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, dear Irakli, we, we have about three, four minutes left. So I, I suggest that uh, we give the final honors to you uh, and, and give final remarks. But um, please do react to what you heard. But there was also one more question. Uh, from one of our younger participants who is actually asking, uh, I believe the person is, is Georgian, uh, how can Georgian youth contribute to Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic integration? So if you could also include that question in your final remarks, that would be great. Thank you very much. Oh, and you need to unmute. <laughs> Uh, the question was asked about uh, Russia's illegal actions, uh, the uh, occupation of Georgian region, regions, and its effect as an impediment on Georgia's NATO and EU integration. Of course, Russia uh, attempts to impede Georgia's approximation with the West, to impede Georgia, hamper Georgia's EU and NATO aspirations. But Georgia, despite this uh, aggressive actions, by the Russian Federation has been very actively pursuing towards its foreign and security policy objectives, which is ultimate membership in EU and NATO. So, of course, Russia's illegal actions do not represent as a veto on Georgia's membership aspirations in EU and NATO. It is well known in Georgia, it is well known among our partners in, uh, throughout the international community, and by no means irrespective of the degree of Russia's aggression in the region against Georgia, Russia will not impede Georgia's uh, European and NATO uh, integration aspirations. Russia's aggressive actions has been directed, have been directed against Georgia since Georgia's regaining its independence in early 90s. 2008 was simply a culmination of Russia's uh, aggression. But despite the fact Georgia has been very actively implementing its steps. It uh, was awarded substantial NATO Georgia package. It has annual national program with the NATO. It signed association agreement with the European Union. It has a visa free travel with the European Union. So Georgia is more and more integrating with the West. We have exemplary and very close relationships with the United States in terms of defense and security cooperation in other areas. So. Russia has many intentions, but has no success in impeding Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. This is 
as regards to this issue. The second issue was asked here about the business climate in Georgia and about uh, some sort of so-called interference in uh, Anaklia deep sea port project. Georgia's business climate is one of the most favorable in the world. There are international rankings. And if you go to the World Bank is doing business in any other rankings, you will see that if someone, a corporation, uh, a, a business entity wants to invest, Georgia is one of the best place to implement investments. And uh, just a clear and a perfect example, recent example, that would attest that would be the report of the United States State Department that was published about a week ago, which says and amply proves that Georgia's business climate is very friendly, very favorable. And uh, I just want to emphasize when uh, we talk about Anaclia, the State Department report emphasizes that there have been no single case since 2012 throughout the history when Georgian dream government has been in power, when foreign direct investments have been threatened in Georgia. So I believe that report speaks uh, a lot about the uh, uh, favorable business climate and all favorable conditions in Georgia for doing uh, business and for making business. As to the uh, next steps on uh, Georgia's uh, membership aspirations towards the Alliance, and what NATO can do for Georgia. Of course, Georgia has been very actively implementing practical steps. We've been very uh, actively having success on the political dimension as well, because high level visits, high level interactions have been also large and significant uh, elements of the political support. And we have done this uh, so far prior to the elections and we will do it after the uh, elections. The next steps, and I would say strategic goal, let's say in the midterm, is to get as many positive marks, as many pluses on our practical steps. And of course, the most important and most significant objective will be to prepare ground for political decision on implementation of the Bucharest Summit uh, Declaration. This is the most important endeavor and objective, how we see the political aspect and the strategic goal on our way towards European, uh, your Atlantic aspirations in the, let's say next three, four or five years. So that's the most important priority. And uh, uh, let me thank again, all the uh, participants. Let me thank the audience for this uh, fantastic, very useful, very productive discussion. And we here in Georgia highly appreciate the practical efforts from our partners to empower and advance Georgia towards its ambitions. And of course, the interest which uh, Georgia maintains in the agenda of our international partners in the academic circles, in think tanks. And uh, once again, thank you very much. No, well, um, I do regret that we do not have more time for debate, but uh, I do congratulate you on the comments that you did raise and uh, the questions that you asked. I, I thought it was a really terrific debate and uh, I could go on and go on and go on, but uh, uh, we only had an hour and 15 minutes. So um, I will perhaps leave this meeting with a message that uh, Georgia has to be kept on the agenda. Uh, the partnership is there um, and you know, GMF, I think, is not a government. We cannot do diplomatic negotiations, but I do believe that our organizations can at least do its little bit to keep Georgia on the agenda. And uh, I'm sure that my colleagues at GMF will agree that uh, we will continue these type of conversations in the future as well. And I think also, uh, perhaps hooking back to the question about youth, this is also something the youth could do, for instance. Uh, why not? So. Let me thank you, all you speakers. Um, this was great. Thank you for making it time. And I do thank the audience as well. Uh, please stay connected for more in the future. And I wish you a very good afternoon uh, from Brussels or if it's uh, a morning in the United States. Goodbye till next time.